So we're gonna we're gonna define the problems that are creating dystonia for a dystonia patient. Okay. Okay. Number one. Okay, problem with inhibition, brake pedal. And you should have multiple brake pedals. Okay, if we take the brain like this, here's the brain, basal ganglia is deep. It's there, it's that. See how it looks like a piece of pizza? Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like a slice of pizza. Okay, this the one, we'll put an I here, an E here. The I is the gas pedal. The E is the brake pedal. That makes sense? Yes. Okay, so if I have a hyperkinetic problem, I don't have a brake pedal. I've got a seriously great gas pedal. Mm -hmm. People would say that I always have had a gas pedal throughout mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's, that's the trend. And so gas pedal versus brake pedal. And that's what this is. There's also a brake pedal. There are a series of brake pedals in the frontal lobe. When we look to the frontal lobe, I'm going to draw it like, like that. Okay. And here's, this is, this is parietal occipital temporal. And this is four, this is six, where you're doing the finger tapping. Mm -hmm. This is eight, where we're doing the eye movements. We're throwing the eyes in the opposite direction. This is nine, sociality, and I like to use Stroop for that. Nine, but nine, 10, and 11, 12, which are right here. These are brake pedals. They're called hyperdirect pathways. This is indirect, direct, okay? And so these are hyperdirect, and so they are gas pe uh, brake pedals. But they are some of the last things to be developed in development, right? And so, and in fact, this one is the, I think we talked about it, the absolute no. And so it's the last thing to get developed where I decide, no, I'm never gonna do that, okay? And then the cerebellum is also a brake pedal, okay? So imagine I should have all of those working and I don't. I've got just a gas pedal, okay? So that's problem number one, but this is a perfect storm of problems. Not everybody with that has dystonia too. Okay, we're gonna go. Okay, vestibular dysfunction. And that means everything that is interrelated with balance, posture, gait, relating to tone of the muscles. Remember the vestibular nuclei determine the tone of the muscles that give you rigidity and hence gravity, but also response to changes in balance, right? And that whole system also includes the head sensor system and everything else that's involved. The cerebellum has a major player, especially especially midline of the cerebellum and that. So we have a dysfunction in that system and therefore it's easy for us to have a dysfunctional tone. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if I've got, if I've got a hypertone on one side and a hypotone on another, what am I going to do? Stick to there one side. There you go. Yes. I'm going to stick to one side. Very good. And so, and, and in, the, in the neck, it's even more complicated because the SCMs are involved with the upper, with the, the uh, upper trapezius, and they are literally wired to those three canals. Those three canals are in the plane of those muscles. And so when it tells it to do something, 
the, the canal, the appropriate canal is activating it, right? And so, but it's, it does the opposite. See, it looks like this should do that, but when it gets smaller, it does this. Interesting. <laughs> Right. So the nerves, like if I just even wear a sports bra or a heavy coat, just the weight on my shoulders uh -huh. triggers me, and then it's they get already all hypersensitive. Okay. And and that's the sensory side of the loop. It's hypersensitive and uh, and in there, and it can activate that. Yeah, yeah. triggers are just ridiculous. Yep, exactly. Number three. Is that any questions about that? No, that's amazing. Lee. Okay. Good. And then. Okay, ocular output dysfunction. Your eyes are wired to your body. The boom part of it, not the visual system. Now, the visual system is going to be intertwined with that, and, and that, uh, that, but I'm talking about the eye movement. And so if I'm looking this way, I'm wired for my entire rest of my neurology to go that way. We did this with those you know, that, that were there at the meeting. I said, okay, sit down, stand up. Sit down, stand up, feel that, that's your baseline. Now sit down, now look down, down with your head, hi Neil, down with your head and down with your eyes. That's two different systems that are engaging your anterior muscles, right? And we did that and they got up and they got up a lot slower and you hear some groans, right? I said, that, that sounds like an old man now. It, it felt like it, yeah. That's because you were going against the grain of the neurology. It said this time, you're gonna look up. Up with your head and up with your eyes. The superior rectus muscles that do this are wired to the extensors of your body, right? They pull you up. And so they looked up and boop, they popped right up. So you see, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. With ocular output dysfunction, we have dysfunction in the, in the nervous system's ability to go in a certain direction. Now, if my eyes can't go in a certain direction, what else can't go that way? Everything. Everything else, mm -hmm. yes. Including your? Tongue. Tongue, because oh. it's wired, it's wired to that. That's why Michael Jordan, <laughs> he has done it so many times, he's done that so many times, he's intuitively felt to do that to stabilize his body. So it's not a, it's not just a cool habit. He's actually counterbalancing his brain he is to do a better job. Exactly. He is optimizing, utilizing his own neurology. His eyes are going in the optimal position. His tongue is going in the optimal position, you know, and which is stabilizing the rest of his body in a way to do the move he's asking it to do. So all those dads who told those daughters to quit imitating him with their tongue sticking out, shame, shame, shame. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, and the other the other part of this is, that's amazing is the grid part of this. Okay, the grid part of this is like when I have you come this way so you see it and and have you touch my finger and touch your nose back and forth. Okay, now close your eyes. Okay, you know where that is because mm -hmm. you have a grid. Mm -hmm. Okay, now stop. Okay, now watch this. I'm gonna do this. Okay, see my finger? Mm -hmm. See my thumb? Mm -hmm. See my middle finger, mm -hmm. ring finger, pinky. Mm -hmm. okay, now we're gonna go back and we're only gonna do this one. So recalibrate, okay, slow it down. Close your eyes, yeah, you feel it? Okay, slow down. Now do my thumb. Okay, now, let, now do my middle finger. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Now go back to your nose, back to your nose, back to middle finger. Okay, see we're, we're seeing the preponderance of a change in the grid on this side. Okay. Okay, because when your grid is working, you'll boom, 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 right? And that's what we're talking about. When you oh saw gosh. the video of, of my patient who yes. couldn't go that way, the grid, if you, if you took that grid 
and smashed it like cellophane, right? And I'm trying to reestablish to pull that back out so that it's like the other side. That makes sense? Yes. And so uh, and when we say ocular output dysfunction, we are also talking about the grid. Yeah. We call it the tectal map. Okay. The tectal map. And there's also an auditory. In fact, with him, I had to start with the auditory. I didn't start with light. I started with a little kid clicker. Click, 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 and then click. And, and you know, he would try to find it. And I'm try we do what's called micro saccades, saccades back and forth. But if I were to do a micro saccade on you, I'd say, look at that, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. I'm trying to create that grid again. And a number but you four. are doing it in controlled chaos, where yes. I would just be doing it in chaos. Yes. Okay. And exactly. I'd be making it worse because I'm just doing random stuff. Like, right. Let's, look at your thumb. Right. Okay. Exactly. So don't try this at home unless you know what the doctor wants you to do. Right. <laughs> right. So we're having a dysfunction of the ability to do you know, so many of these things between the spinal cord and the cortex. And so we have to integrate those together. Not only do we have to get this, the spinal cord to work doing this and get the cortex to work, but to get the two to actually link up and function together we have to have right, left, and above, down, all working together. And so when we talk about dystonia, this is the problem. And I okay? definitely And I have to sol solve all those problems. And in solving all those problems, it's actually causing the system to function in a healthy way, the way it was designed to, at each of those levels of problem. And so, when, when you say, what do I do for dystonia? I say, okay, there's the, there's the guiding principles, the guiding systems of, these are the things I'm gonna work with, but then I've got, I call it the science, and then the art, <laughs> right? Exactly. Because how you present is going to dictate how I'm doing it. Okay. And I design it for the person. That makes sense? Yes, thank you.